Perfect. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Chen, for the opportunity to speak to you today about the Fitness Program and hopefully another tool or asset that can be used to help um, provide a very new population um, a health effort. So um, I have nothing to, to disclose, no financial um, uh, purposes up with this. I will not be discussing off-use labels or any medications, but I will be talking about medications that have been approved by the FAA for pilots to be able to use, but I will not be discussing other than here's a list. <coughs> and so we'll, we'll talk about a little bit, uh, some of the his some history, uh, we'll talk about a case example, we'll talk about the HIMSS program, we'll talk about also some other lifestyle interventions that might be able to be made, and then we'll end if there's a qu any, any questions that you have that we can talk about today. So, <clears throat> um, I love history. I didn't really realize I loved history until the military forced me to take enough classes to basically have a degree in history, and then I started realizing how much I really loved history. Sometimes I find my, my children question whether I should have been a history teacher or not. <clears throat> anyway, so I racked my brain of like, when do I remember the very, very first pilot you know, like aircraft disaster? And so um, if I make a lot of 80s references, it's because that was my decade that I grew up in when I had a kid to the 80s. And for some of you, Likely, hopefully some of you remember 1982. If you don't, just please nod your heads and, and, and uh, just appreciate the bad humor that I'll have. But on the 13th of January, eight, 1982, was the first time I ever really remember a plane crash. And this was the Florida Flight uh, 90. And it left um, Reagan National, which is now Reagan National, back at the National Airport. And... Um, Within 20 seconds, it veered off course, crashed and hit the, the 14th Street, Street overpass, and which is a bridge that basically overpasses that. It's where the 380, the, the, three, no, the 395 crosses the Potomac. And you can see right here at the bottom a wonderful picture of the, the fuselage tail right here, right here into that overpass. And it was, you know, really a, a tragic story. This was, at least, again, in my lifetime, the, one of those accidents that I really remember was like, wow, that was interesting. You know, unfortunately, there were 78 deaths. Um, if you were to go back and Google this, you see about a lot of these heroic um, people that were jumping in the water, trying to rescue people who had just fallen into the ice. They it was super cold. And when they look back at this, you know, they, they came up with two causes. One is the icing. And for us that live here in Utah that have been flying recently, we realize how much air how much has been the industry has changed and they really take this very seriously with the de-icing. But there was also a significant pilot error. And when we talk about that, when we review the history, very we focus more on the de-icing part and less on the pilot error. Um, there are countless examples, not, you know, just trying to be e equilateral and choose on a lot of different type of airlines and just not Florida Airlines that went out of business. Um, this was the 5th of May 2000. This was uh, Southwest Flight 1455. It left, left Las Vegas. It hit the airport and it overran and you know, you can imagine if you were here at this Chevron gas station filling up, and all of a sudden you see a 757 kind of crashing through, you might have a few expletives that might come out of your mouth. Um, and when, again, fortunately there was only two injured on, on this flight, but again we have the cause of air pilots. Now maybe a, you know, we pick a lot on, on, on this, let's, let's kind of end with a good news story. This is again early 15th January 2009. Um, this was uh, flight 1549 was leaving Lombardi Airport. It was about 8.30 in the morning. And within 20 seconds of achieving full air, it hit a flock of seagulls. Um, I will refrain from any jokes about a flock of seagulls. <laughs> um, I did shave my hair so I don't have the weed roller. Um, 
But unlike other incidences, they had a phenomenal captain on board. And he miraculously was able to, to turn the whole airplane around and do a, a stunning land on the Hudson River. There were zero injuries, and it was kind of viewed as a miracle. But even with this miraculous landing, everybody was quick to point out, well, um, you know, Captain Solomon, you must have had some type of mental illness. You must have had something, you know, looking for a justification of why you couldn't have, have got the airplane to, to Newark because the, the plane, you know, the airport's Newark was 15 more seconds away. Why did you have to do this? And, and, and so I mentioned this because there's this, this huge scrutiny on the airline industry because of various tragedies, rightfully or, or, or not. Um, and again, the cause of error was loss of engine power, which was totally because they ran into some random flocks of seagulls that was just happened to take off right there with the LaGuardia Airport. And so this was a survey that was on the internet. It was by Talkspace, and it listed the top 10 fears within Americans. First is fear of heights. Number two is fear of germs. Number three is fear of flying. Number four is fear of spiders. Number five is fear of snakes. Uh, number six is fear of needles. Seven is fear of public speaking. Um, fear of dogs. I don't know why people would have fear of dogs, but that's what's on the list. And then fear of confined spaces. Um, I forget what it is. Like. And, and so, and I think because you've had a lot of these types of crashes, even though the, pipe, the, the flight industry has been able to show that flying by plane is still one of the safest forms of transportation because we've had some of these that uh, there is a lot that the airlines try to, tries to do to um, secure the safety of its pilots and secure its image. You know, what is the, what is the, you know, there's some glamorization of what it means to be an airline pilot. Um, they get to fly in all of these exotic places. And really, once somebody becomes a pilot, they're really in this competitive dog eat dog world trying to, where they try to bid on what are considered the top flights. And so there's, there's a very uh, seniority structure that's built upon this. You know, some of the less desirable flights are there and back. Um, type of flights. The more desirable ones are these seven day flights where they might hit several cities. There might be some rest stop days and then they come back. Um, you guys are probably are aware of this that the number one chief medical complaint of pilots are lower back injuries and that's just from sitting in the cockpit on those lovely comfortable chairs for hours upon air hours. But, you know, from a part that we probably don't appreciate is how many pilots struggle with actually being alone. Because each night they're in a different hotel. You know, if they go to airports, where do most airports hang out? They have hang out within the, the lounges. There's alcohol being served within the lounges. And it, it, it really kind of sets it up for a bad environment to where they can, have, they can develop a lot of these challenges within their behaviors. So, um, I told you guys this was going to be history, uh, uh, a history lesson. So we're going to talk about the Cobra Towers. And um, this was June 25th, 1996. This was a huge explosion that rocketed barracks within the United States Air Force. Uh, this is a wing of Co one of the Air Force bases in, in Saudi Arabia. 19 U.S. Airmen were killed and over uh, nearly 500 total people. And this was just U.S. plus also the local foreigns that were working here at this Air Force complex. You can kind of see what some of the glass injury looked at. Um, down here, we can, you can kind of see this is where the runway is. So this crater here represents here. This building right here represents this right here, just to kind of give you a little diagram of how this was. 
Um, this is the worst <laughs> attack towards U.S. Up to you know, prior to this was the uh, the attack of the 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 Beirut, the Beirut Marine Barracks in 1983, and since then we know that 9/11 has been more devastating than this. But this was really one of those sh rock your boats types of events. So I would like to introduce you guys to um, patient PD. His name isn't PD, but we're just going to call him PD for the discussion today. And today, PD is 56 years old. But on June 25th, 1996, PD was a major in the U.S. Air Force. He was originally from New York. He, he experienced, you know, similar to many people, just a lot of childhood neglect from parents that were very busy in kind of the New York uh, boroughs area. But he had this dream of always wanting to be a pilot. And after graduating from Sunny Broom, he commissioned in the U.S. Air Force and became a pilot. And his, his specialty within the Air Force was he worked with special forces where they just kind of did these, either mass dropping off people really quickly and getting out of there, or we need to land somebody really quick to get, get war fighters and get out. This was PD's job within, within the Air Force. And in 1996, he received his first active duty tour, and it happened to be at Al Khwar, Saudi Arabia. And at, at 9, 10 in the morning, he was cleared to leave the airfield. And 20 minutes later, he, rep he heard of this mass devastation of the Cobar Towers. And his heart dropped because that's where all of his friends, colleagues, battle buddies were right there. Um, he says, it gutted me. I told them I could quickly circle back and help, but I was told to fly on. Um, Three of the U.S. airmen that were reported dead were very close friends of Major PD at the time. He says, I think about them. I know if I was there, I probably would, I probably would have died. I still just wonder if I had not been so, I still just wonder if I was not so far out that I may have been able to shoot the terrorists before they got there. And so clearly he's still troubled with, with this experience that he had having been so close to that. But as we know, and, and as you all know, you know, the military is such that we must soldier on or, or, or military on. And, you know, this was kind of like one of those things is like, you know, don't think, so, don't think treatment because that is weakness. And I carry on. And as soon as he finished his initial commitment, he then transferred to the United States um, Air Force Reserves. And then he started working for, as a commercial pilot. Um, he achieved the, re the grade of lieutenant colonel, but he left military before retiring, and it just kind of struggled with that whole bureaucracy that many times m many of you have heard with military life. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, as a reservist, he started working for, one, for National Airlines. Um, he got married. He decided to enjoy the, the better life from New York and moved to San Diego. Um, <clears throat> he he has three he has three sons, and you know once he once he got out of the military or was he was flying more as a commercial pilot. Flying was his everything; it was his way to escape, or I, I should say, it wasn't his way to escape. It was his way to try to not. It was a place where he didn't have to deal with the problems of being back home. But when he was home, he was angry, mad, irritable at everybody. He was just snappy and just wasn't. And I've, uh, anyways, this is not who he is today, but this is the way that he describes himself. And, and as you can imagine, his first marriage didn't work and he got a divorce in 2014. He, since his, Airlines was stationed in Utah, and you guys can kind of guess what that means. Um, and it wasn't Western Airlines. Um, um, he transitioned, he, he moved to Park City. 
Um, and, you know, shortly thereafter, he remarried. And he, he describes that his second marriage was more miserable than his first. Um, he says, I lost my edge. Flying was no longer fun. I was not happy in any area of my life. Um, and he went to, he says he went to what a, a, one of his national meetings and he heard a pilot talk about the HIMSS program. He said, I was scared. I knew what happened to pilots in the military if they ever talked about mental health. They were put out to pasture. He said this was not going to happen to him. You know, again, probably this is, these are, are themes that many of you have, have dealt with, many, many professionals who are in similar type of manners. He said, though, a few months after that conference, he just was becoming angrier and angrier, and he just thought about this program and just wondered if this pilot was really telling the truth or if he was full of excrement. <laughs> and, you know, he spent about six months talking with that pilot, just trying to get more and more information about what would the HIMSS program be like, what would he have to sacrifice to be able to go through that. And in June in 2019, I mean 18, he finally called the HIMSS program. So what is this lovely thing called the HIMSS program? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so this was developed in correlation with the, the FAA in the 1970s. And, you know, wh when we look about, you know, I, I know there's a few physicians in here, and, and we think about how much it costs to go to med school and how much is invested in that. We're not the only profession that offers all, you know, has to pay a lot to be able to get into to the program. You know, a, a typical pilot um, to just get your like pilot's license to like fly a little Cessna type of a plane, you're, you're in it about $20,000. To become, to get all the certifications, to become a commercial pilot if you're not going through the military, you're in it about four to five years, and similar to med school, and you're out about a hundred thousand dollars, a little less than med school, but still, this it's still it's still a pretty penny. <coughs> Once that happens and you get enrolled into the, the the a program, there are some programs that are better than others of developing their pilots, but a new pilot becomes the assistant pilot and has to do several years of certification in flying before they can be become a full captain. And at the end, the airline industry probably, probably spends about $500,000 in additional training to get a pilot to be a full captain. So you can imagine that the, the FAA or these airlines are motivated that if they've spent that much money in a pilot, that they want to try to do everything that they can to help the pilot. And so um, this was, the HIMSS program was initially designed as a way to collect da data about pilots who might have alcohol use disorder and just to track it. And to then to see if they could track it and monitor it. Could they develop a program wherewith they could help pilots get back into the, to the cockpit and fly? Because that's when they're happy and that's when we, we've not lost money on this person that we've, been, th we've had that. And so what's important, and I was discussing this with Dr. Chen earlier, is the FAA does not administer an, a HIMSS program. Each airline is responsible for how they will administer the HIMSS program. And, and so why that is important is there are some airlines which are very good about paying for all of the fees for their pilots and all of the expenses. There are other airlines, which we won't talk about, <laughs> that don't. And fortunately for the pilot who lived here in Salt Lake and the airlines that he worked for, this was one of the pilot, they were very prompt about paying for everything. And so the HIMSS program, it's it's individually administered, and they're really trying to promote the effective recovery in the process of their pilots. And the other part is that this is not a mandatory program. 
this is a voluntary program where the, the pilot agrees that they're going to seek treatment so that they have a chance of returning back to the pilot to the cock seat the the cockpit um, if they get caught and their dereliction of duty they lose all possibility and not everybody that enters in the program is guaranteed to get through the program um, just for a random guess let's say a pilot uh, a plane that crashes what is the typical settlement for that the airlines industry has to pay for each person who dies yeah it's it's 1.5 million per patient per individual that dies and it, again this is huge amounts of money this is huge image this is huge marketing that you can't and this is why most airlines are very motivated to try to work with their pilots in trying to have this you know you could say you know the medical profession probably could learn something from the hymns program but i'll just leave it at that <laughs> so it has taken there is an involvement of what hymns has been but this is what the hymns program currently is as of 2017 so it's a step down program and what i'll be talking here is is more for what is considered for the substance use arm of it there's also a, a mental health arm of it there's also a an arm for it if somebody develops a, a physical illness dr chen was mentioning that she has a, a, a an associate that has a cardiac anomaly there would be a program that would be be specifically for I hate to call them medical disorders because mental health and substance where they're all medical but it more physical disorders versus um, substance use or mental health and so step number one is there is an assessment by a HIMS certified psychiatrist or a HIMS certified practitioner so the practitioner would would help if there's um, physical health t related symptoms and a behavioral health provider like a psychiatrist would do if there's any type of mental health or substance use they could have an, an additional addiction provider but their preference is to have a, a mental uh, like a psychiatrist that could do both the psychiatric portion as well as the the, the substance use and so then af as part of this assessment a treatment plan is developed now again if you work for an airlines like one that's here in Salt Lake that it pays for all the treatment you know as a hymns the hymns psychiatrist could say you need to go do three months of intensive inpatient I mean going to inpatient for three months and then you need to do three months of partial hospitalization and three months of IOP program and then you need to do this 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 and this and because they're paying for all of this it gets done um, if one works for a provider who an airlines that doesn't cover for that and that is the recommendation of this person right here oops this person right here that treatment must be done here in this first step or there is no pass and go there is no going to step two there's no doing anything else so it's really beholden that this person kind of understands what the recommendation or, or the or the treatment has, is going and it doesn't mean that we make an exception for the individual that has to pay out of pocket but I, I think maybe it's we take that into consideration for an example if somebody has mental health for example P, PD who we're talking about would he what benefit would a brain scan provide would it be nice I mean is there a chance that all of his his change of behavior is due because there's a brain tumor is that a possibility what is the likelihood of that so again it's trying to use resources that are appropriate 
and that we make the right recommendations for this. Again, this would, would, would include weekly aftercare. Um, this is the part that is not negotiable. And this is what the airlines has to provide. So that there has to be an, an, a monthly peer meeting from a fellow pilot who will check in on their pilot. There's a crew, there's a chief pilot who's also checking on it. Again, this is the airlines need to provide these individuals. And so depending upon your airlines, you might have more support here than others. You know, there, it says that you're supposed to do peer support group, which would be AA, NA, whatever your peer support, you know, whatever is, is appropriate. You know, I, I think you could also have life ring or any, you know, Dharma recovery based upon whatever that the program is chosen. In the first year, there's <coughs> approximately 14 randomized urine tests <coughs> and they must meet with their home medical provider of record who's kind of like overseeing the actual or providing the actual treatment at least every three months. And it is based really upon the evaluation of the peer pilot as well as the chief pilot. And if they feel that they're making progress, whether or not they can transition into phase two. Without this recommendation, if, if the individual cannot, you know, just cannot not return, you know, just constantly returns back to their substance use, cannot achieve any degree of sobriety, they could exit the program right here. Um, the airlines will say, thank you very much, and you're out. And so the pilot will be like, expletive, 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 something like with Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. I, I thought if I came into this program, I was going to be guaranteed. And, and that's really is, there's no guarantees. If we do this and we crash out, we still get the benefits of having tried something. If I don't do any of this and I get caught, I lose everything as a pilot and there's no stop, you know, no pass and go, collecting $200, you know, much like what you have with a lot of the other professional organizations that you guys work with. So <clears throat> phase two then typically is a two to four year assessment. In many instances, this is where the pilots can start thinking about going back to, to flying again. And this is a part where they really can start having a little bit of hope because it's like, well, wait a second, things might actually be improving. And, and so there's actually some good studies behind this. And, and one of it, there's a study uh, by Chambers et al. that they looked at 9,000 individuals who had been into treatment. And they followed this, this group of people for nine years. And they made some predictions based upon how long they were able to achieve sobriety. And so not surprisingly, about the first, you know, 90% nine, of people re return to use within the first month. If an individual is able to maintain sobriety or is in a program and maintains, bare, you know, the treatment, you know, maintains sobriety for that first year, their chances increases to 67% lifetime that they'll be able to maintain sobriety. If they can get to that three-year mark, now it hits at 81%. If they can get to that five-year mark, it's now 85. No, it's 81 at three, per, at three years, it's 85 at five years. And so then that roughly corresponds with, the, we, with these steps of really why they're trying to engage them into treatment. And what is the most effective treatment? Well, it's the treatment that a person can commit to. And this is one of the nice things about the HIMSS program is they can pretty much mandatory, <laughs> you must do treatment. And, but it, uh, but it, they provide these opportunities. So again, step two to four, we still have these monthly assessments with both the peer pilot and the chief pilot. They're still encouraged to go to peer support groups. They still get 14 random drug tests a year, and they still are supposed to see their um, provider of record three time, every, th every three months. Uh, you know, if they get into this five to seven year, there's, you know, then they can just still 
you know, the level of supervision goes down because they feel that, it, again, the, the studies show that they're that much more stable within their own recovery. Now, um, when we start talking about behavioral health, you know, a lot of these same things, I'm going to come back here to this diagram here, a lot of these same type of things would still be, pl would still be in place. So the person, instead of working on the addiction side, would still have a psychiatrist that they would have this initial assessment. And this initial psychiatrist may say, hey, you need to do inpatient hospitalization at said, lugar, said place for whatever period of time, or you must start going into therapy, or I mean, they, they still will work out a treatment plan. And part of this treatment plan may be like, hey, you really need to be on medications. Um, and so this is kind of like the flow sheet for medications. So you can kind of like see, you know, there are four medications that the FAA have approved that pilots can take long-term. Um, fluoxetine, escitalopram, sertraline, and citalopram. So during that first year period, I start the medications. If I come off of it, I have to be reassessed to make sure that I'm stable on that. If I decide I really like the benefits of being on the medications, then I have to go through a whole nother series of tests. And basically for, you know, that might be whatever your airlines has set up then they, you have to go through certain uh, cognitive testing to ensure that your cognitive skills have not declined while being on the medications. And if you can document all of those, you can finally then petition the FAA down here for an official waiver. And then you can remain on that medication as long as the pilot and the pilot's provider agrees that it's worthwhile to stay on that medication. So um, we talked about PD and he had his initial um, HIMSS evaluation by a psychiatrist and then he quickly saw a primary care physician and the primary care physician started him on sertraline because that was one of the, the magic four. Um, again, he was fortunate that his provider, his airlines provided him complete support because out of this he was then doing weekly um, Th therapy work, which included some EMDR work, which included a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, he needed a psychiatrist because the box said, I need a psychiatrist. So he's up in Park City. How do I find a psychiatrist? He calls, well, there's the University of Utah. I will contact the University of Utah. And by happenstance, I became his treating psychiatrist. So that's how I entered into this story. Um, you know, and, and so basically he now has this year off of his life and for the physicians in the room, you've worked how many years to get this magic piece of paper that says you can practice medicine. And now all of a sudden you're told, oh, by the way, you can't practice medicine for the next year. You basically have to get your life back together again. I couldn't do that. You know, my, a lot of my personal identity is really wrapped up in I'm a provider. Yet this identity that pilots have, I think is equally as important or is equally, you know, that same type of a thing that we as providers have with our license, they have that same attachment to being that it's their identity. And to his credit, he just really said, okay, if that's what they require, I'll do it. And so he stripped everything out of his life and he says, okay, what did I like? What do I like about, what did I like when I was most healthy? Okay, I'm going to start working out. You know, I really like helping people. And so he found, found local organizations up in the Park City area where he could start volunteering a few times a week, just helping randomly whomever type of people. More important for him, he also started reconnecting with his children. And, and so you can imagine this distant relationship that he had following the divorce. He became estranged with his children and he just started 
going down and just saying, let's just talk, let's go camping, let's do whatever, just to have that reconnecting with his children. Um, he also realized that he wasn't happy in his second marriage. And he realized that it would be a, a huge financial challenge because of you know that potential of being a pilot, how much he would have to walk away from potentially an alimony. And he, and he knew that she might have been contentious, but he was just like, I've got to get, I can't have this in my life. And just basically walked and signed a check and just left. He divorced, he moved up to, part, to Heber City. Um, he, over this first year, he's like, you know, I don't trust myself without sertaline. I know I'm doing so much better on this medication. I'm going to ask that I, I want to petition the FAA for a waiver, knowing that they may not grant me a waiver and knowing I, I may never fly again. And so he had to fly to Atlanta. There he had to do a series of cognitive evaluations. Um, are people familiar with the Stroop test? <clears throat> so the Stroop test is I show you a bunch of colors written out, like red is in red, blue is in blue, purple is in purple, and I have you read the list of what the, what the word says. And if it's the same color, it's easy to do, right? The Stroop test then changes the color with the word. So red might be written in blue, green might be written you know, in, in yellow, and then you have to test both identifying the color versus identifying the word. These are some of the cognitive types of testing that they might have you do. Um, you know, he sent me the text. I mean, we became fairly good friends over the course of this. And he, this, is, um, this was the text when he got back from the FAA that he finally got cleared to be able to fly again. And he got the, the, the voucher to say that. He says, hello, Dr. Sugden, I have amazing news. I got my first class medical certificate back from the FAA yesterday. I seriously can't tell you how grateful I am for, you, for all that you have done to help me get better. I can now return to work. Part of my special insurance is that I must continue to see you once a year and have your clinical assessment, assessment sent over to Dr. T, the HIMSS AME. Next time I come in for appointment, I will bring a short instructions the FAA provided me. Sorry for reaching out on your personal cell. I just wanted to share the awesome news. Have a great weekend. Um, he was cleared. He retrained on the Airbus three, th um, three, th three, 320 series. I don't know if any of you have driven in this plane. It's a very nice plane. He loves this plane. When he recertified, he's like top of the class. He says he's sharper. He's thinking better than he has ever had before. He texted me, he says, finish training and have my first flight back today. Thank you for everything. Um, he mentions now that he loves flying again. Um, he's also been able to reconnect with his kids. He's been able to be present as, as they've graduated from college. Um, <coughs> And, and as I say this, I know that this is an exception, but this is the exception that I have of how we can help return pilots. And I understand this story of PD isn't necessarily going to be everybody's story, but this is his story. And PD is such an amazing person that now that he saw that it, this has worked for him, he is like, I've got to get, there are other pilots out there that are struggling. I need to be that voice for them. And so he's really developed to work to become an advocate for other pilots. And so, of course, I get the text of saying, this is what I've done. Hey, Doc was asked to be the opening speaker at a two-day conference on pilots and mental health. The federal air surgeon was there with, hi with her staff, including the FAA chief psychiatrist, number two at Delta, oh, excuse me, all these other places. Um, <laughs> He says, it's a perfect way to begin the, the, the two-day conference. I mentioned, mentioned you. I hope that's okay. It's so amazing to be back flying. I'm so grateful for you for everything you've done to help me get better. It's amazing to feel normal again and the stigma. So again, 
he's an, an he's a remark I mean he was a remarkable person before I ever met him and it's interesting because I can you know when he talked about himself being angry irritable I cannot see this in his personality but I also didn't see him in the height of when the symptoms were really that severe and I, I think that that's the part that we don't realize sometimes is what they might be able to come or where they've come so to end I, I just wanted to talk a few moments because you know, sometimes our, our work industry that we work with may not always be able to be on medications or we might have to think about other medications that, that they can be on and some of those medications might affect certain things. And so I, I want to leave the, 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 the argument of lifestyle a, a, as a great intervention. So three out of five Americans have at least one chronic illness and two of out of five have two or more chronic illnesses. So 60% have one chronic illness, 40% have at least two. Chronic illnesses can be everything, diabetes, heart disease, mental health, you name it, it's there. And the College of American College, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine has really tried to be this advocate of trying to help people restore back to their lifestyle and, and they have focuses on eating healthier, having increased physical activity, managing stress, improving relationships, improving sleep, and ris avoiding risky substances. And so I, I just want to talk a little bit about our, our gut microbiota. And so this here is our lovely gut microbiota. And our guts are happy if we have lots of fiber in our diet. And if we have lots of fiber in our diet, it's interesting because then it naturally produces serotonin. And if we have natural productions of serotonin, you know, it's the same thing what a lot of our antidepressants are involved with. It provides neuroprotection. Now, what is, we, we call this the sa standard American diet. It's also referred as the SAD diet. <sighs> Um, this was a study that looked over 20 years. So this is the this looked over a 20-year period, and it looked at basically the composition of what was the typical diet. And so this looks here at males. Oops. We have males here, females here, and I'll just take it to the the part that I want you to focus on. Across the United States, males, females, about 60% of our diet consists of ultra-processed foods. When we look at races, whether it's non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic black, or Hispanic, you know, lovely, we're still, I mean, Hispanic might be better at 50% probably because they're better eating beans than the rest of us are, but we're still at about that 60% of our diet is consumed by ultra-processed foods. What is an ultra-processed food? Well, it's mass-produced, it's consistent. You know, when you, when you think, of, think of all of this, um, what comes to mind is the Twinkie, right? How long does a Twinkie last? Um, I, I think the, I, there's been pictures documented of a Twinkie that's been, you know, 50 years old, that it's still accessible. Yeah, <laughs> delicious. And, and, and I, I mentioned this, you know, and we think about what's in the special sauce, you know, all, all this wonderful goodness, right? Uh, Who has traveled here lately in an airport? And, and, and what is the wonderful food choice that's available to our pilots? And you all work with a lot of professionals that do a lot of truck driving or even the, I mean, who of here has been lately at the hospital at the University of Utah in their cafeteria and have seen the wonderful food options that are provided to us as healthcare providers? Um, let alone what if you get a truck driver and they're stopping off at these lo local truck stops, what is the lo likelihood of that they're, you know, what is their food content going to be like? And so I just say this in, in trying to develop some compassion with that this is. You know, when we start talking about professionals, this is really a significant thing. And so when you get our gut biota and we add a lot of these ultra processed foods, uh, automatically we then start having an unhealthy uh, gut mi microbiota. And this is called dysbiosis. And what happens is no longer are we having this lovely dietary fiber 
because by definition, an ultra processed food has no fiber. We then lose this serotonin production and we lose the neuroprotection. And you can kind of see how vital it is, is you know, we, we get serotonin from tryptophan and it's really only through our gut that it's, di it's processed into serotonin. And so I can give you all of the SSRIs in the world that I want, but if I only have 10% per of serotonin in a body, I can't squeeze more out of that. It's really trying to generate more serotonin and really the diet is one of those most healthy things to do this. <clears throat> now I understand this next study is hard to make correlations complete because this is uh, 550 bank employees in the UK and so they naturally describe themselves as middle class and I know that a lot of the people that we work with don't fit this criteria but this is one of the best studies still that I have found that have been trying to look at diet and mental health. And I want to draw you here to um, this, this graph right here, where it says people that have low fiber in their diet have higher mental health, and people that have high fiber in their diet have less mental health. And when we talk about, oh, what do we consider the most healthy thing in our diets? Well, we want protein. We've got to have protein. We've got to have protein. And so here they looked at whey protein and, and, and correlating it. And when people have little protein, they have less mental health values. And when they have high protein, it shows that their mental health was worse. And again, this was a correlation of these 550 bank employer employers in Britain. This, we had the same correspondence with how they, they slept. Uh, people slept better on high fiber diets than they did on low fiber, di fiber diets and they slept worse on low protein diets. So I'm gonna just tie this into a little bit of substance use and kind of like what it might be doing to our brain. We know here in the ventral tegmental area, this is where we have dopamine production. And on a good day, we have this sporadic release of dopamine. Dopamine again gets to our nucleus accumbens and it releases even more dopamine, which is kind of like the distribution center. It's kind of like your your UPS center uh, of, of the brain. And on a good day, it's going to have the sporadic dopamine to our prefrontal cortex, and we're going to have concentration, organization, and focus. You know, we have our coffee in the morning, we have whatever that is to get us stimulated, right? Well, if we have unhealthy regulations of dopamine initially, and this can be take your substance of choice, could take your activity of choice, um, we have this lovely thing called the amygdala, which is kind of like the sensory activation. And it's interesting that the nucleus accumbens will then release cortisol releasing factor to the, to the amygdala. And as this happens, we now have this thing called incentive salience, which is basically, I need dopamine. And the nucleus accumbens like saying, hey, wait a second there, tiger, you're having there too much dopamine. Let's try to downregulate our dopamine receptors to try to protect the brain because we know at high dopamine concentrations, we have neurotoxicity. And if this establishment is too great, we're like, expletive that, I am going to get the dopamine that I want. And we turn to higher and higher amounts of dopamine. And we go, oh, okay, cool, we got dopamine throughout the brain. But we also know that with high dopamine levels, all of that lovely reasoning of our prefrontal cortex goes out the window, right? we lose the ability to think long-term and all we can think is short-term. So this is how I wanna try to, to end this, is we, we have, once serotonin is established in our gut, it's then stored here in the RAFA nuclei, which is kind of like the UPS center for serotonin. And serotonin is, serotonin is amazing because it's one of the few neurotransmitters that actually helps induce um, neuroplasticity, which is the brain growth, which is trying to create alternative pathways. And sure enough, we know that serotonin is really a better counter to all of those excess dopamine centers within the brain. Us trying to come up with a better
dopamine blocker isn't going to work because it's like we already have the, free, the dopamine freeway in our brain. We really have to develop these alternative sideways to be able to help promote this neuroplastic growth. And this is something through healthier activities of these lifestyle interventions can be for pilots, physicians, truck drivers, <laughs> firefighters, and you know, most of these people like to be healthy anyway, and it can be just a restoration of that. So with that, I appreciate your attentiveness today, and I'm open for any questions that you guys might have. Yes, sir. Can, can I ask two? One I think you've answered, but I'm curious about it. Um, I work in medical administration. One thing that we see is if a doctor's away for a while, it's perishable skills, as much as we might hate to admit it. We lose that, and we get worried about bringing them back on staff. Uh, if I'm understanding right, while you go through the HIMSS program, he's out. He's, he's out. out. Um, and, and what they are doing is a retraining. Correct. So, so I, I, they cover that. But the other issue that comes up with workers' comp, uh, and our own Ed Holmes and Allen College wrote about the SPICE protocol, so it goes back to the military, where they showed that rapid redeployment of injured soldiers did a lot for their mental health with respect to PTSD. Is there any role for, I understand why they can't yeah. be flying, but is there any role for them to have a function within the airlines so they don't get displaced with that sense of self? So I will argue that the, the military data was probably inconclusive, that rushing people back into a, an environment that caused the initial assault isn't always the healthiest part. And sometimes well, I'm troubled by it. But yeah, so I, I'm going to just take that, as a, with I, I'm going to take that as a caveat. So I, I think that that is one of the, I mean, by having those regular checkups with their, their, peer, their peer pilot and their chief pilot is one of the ways that the HIMSS program is trying to keep pilots still active within their community. Um, they can still attend their, their equivalent of CMEs. They, they can still have that association with that. But really, it's a, they're on a short-term disability for that, at least that first year as they're trying to take that time off. Do they allow them the simulators at all, or is that not even? No. <laughs> and, 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 and that is the, that is the, the challenge. You know, that's the, that's the oh, snap moment. I, that's the part of, like, I'm going to give up for sure at least a year of my life and maybe not be able to get back into flying versus if I get caught, I lose everything. Um, and, and so, and I, I think that, that, that it's, it's a hard sell for many pilots to be able to take on that, just the same as it would be, it's hard for many physicians to take on that. So at the five year mark, if they've been able to graduate from the program, their chances of success is quite high at 85%. Correct. But is that self-selected? Mm -hmm. Because if you are with an airline that is resource rich and highly incentivized to pay for all your treatment, that's a better, you know, you have more resources versus an airline that says, good luck to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? No, and, and that's the, I mean, and I think that that's why certain airlines, pilot, I mean, when you talk with pilots, so I have a younger brother who's trying to become a pilot, and I say, Younger brother of mine, where do you want to, which air, which airline organization do you want to work with? And he's like, um, Delta, 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 Delta. And I'm like, after that, which one do you want to work? Um, Sky Air, you know, which is kind of like in the subsidiary of Delta, because many people coming into the industry know about that, and it's important to them. Question: How do they choose the peer-to-peer -peer support? people like is it like so that's part of the, the as each of the airlines has a it's how they administer that and so that they have then other pilots who will volunteer to be those him co-pilots and those him support and those him chiefs so it's the pilots itself select and most of them have gone through the program themselves so that they can talk about what it's like to go through the program and then do they have support for those? Like, is there somebody who checks in with those? It, it's, it's almost like a group therapy afterwards that they kind of, you know, they, they do that. And then at a lot of the national meetings, they kind of still get together and they, they kind of do their own assessment of checking in to see how their own progress is going. 
Yes. So if any point during this process, the pilot has a relapse, is it, are they just out? Or is there some... I mean, I, 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 so relapse is part of the illness. And I think a lot of it is depends upon how significant is the relapse. Okay. So if I have just a cocktail and then I realize, oh snap, I need to start doing something and I admit and I, I test negative the next time and I'm good. Okay. But if, it, if, if the relapse turns into a binge, which turns into this, which turns into miss this, which turns into a, a, a negative, you know, a, a, a urinary toxicology that tests positive, then that's when trouble starts happening. Okay. I was just curious where kind of how tight the guardrails were there. And I, I think a lot of it just depends upon what the history is like and, and what is, you know. And then I, I, I think for most industries, their idea is they really support the abstinence theory and not the, that you can't, that you, they, they would not support the, the social drinker. Yes. So who determines expulsion from the program? Is it like a committee or yeah. the? It, it's, it's a committee that, that's really driven by the evaluations. And, and so the, that initial chem psychiatrist is really somebody who is just kind of overseas and gets the doctor reports and, and just reads and writes this whole evaluation up. And if the patient or the pilot is missing therapy appointments or isn't doing this or isn't doing that or, you know, there's all the documentation and the kids the providers just kind of like doing an overall summary like saying this is what's going on the patients said the pilots had this encounter had this encounter had this encounter and it's like and then sends it back to the faa and the faa looks at it and it's like question so you know especially with medical cannabis becoming more um prevalent the answer is it, it's still not in it. So you don't suspect, you don't think there is going to ever be like a lawsuit saying it's like EEOC or ADA violation and I need my medical and, cannabis? So because it's the federal government is still listed as it as that it's a illicit substance and it's still as a schedule one that it's still as a medication, yeah. still as a schedule one. As long as that's the federal government's policy, the FAA is going to change because it's a federal program. It's the same type of a thing with the military. It's the same type of a thing with anything that's a federal organization. Commercial truck driving, FMCSA. Yeah. <laughs> so, so following that real, I'm sorry. If you're, go ahead. No, real briefly. So with, with airlines being such an international business where we have pilots from KLM flying mm -hmm. into the U.S. back and forth, do you have any knowledge of whether or not that would be the case for... I, 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 I don't. I, I don't. I, I imagine most organizations try to keep... Keep replicable with what the United States standards are. I, I don't think that the United States standards are going to be much different than what is Europe or or or. So Portugal has the least restrictive drug policy, so it's the Portuguese that you have well, to worry. About. Well, and if you've ever traveled in the in like in Southeast Asia with a bucket airlines, I mean, there's all these white guys who are behind getting the pilot oh. airplane. You wonder like, okay, why is he here and not flying for an airline where he's going to get 10 times as much in the U.S.? Yeah. So, I mean, the other part of the disclosure yes. that I probably can talk about now is um, the PD, the patient, it, you know, he's been trying to advocate for getting me to become a HIMSS psychiatrist. And it's been probably four years. And so... I get to, to take the official training in September. And so then Dr. Chen and I have talked about how do we then maybe expand what is a service that's provided here within your organization of being another resource. Resource. Service line, because we do see the Delta. I have a question about that. With the providers that are chosen for the HIMSS program, is there like specific training or something to help them understand what a pilot's going through? I feel like that's a big miss in yeah, EMS. Yeah, so basically I have to go to a, a program in September and then I have to commit to going to, to these training programs, biannual trainings, as long as I want to be a hemp psychiatrist. Yeah. Question, I was kind of surprised when you said that the PCP was the one that described the SSRI. Well, and, and for patient PD, um, 
he was able to get in to see his primary care physician faster than he was able to get in to see a psychiatrist. And so he was, he has a little bit of anxiety of, of, of himself. It's like, oh, I've got to do everything because I really want to get started quickly. And so he previously had been started on certainly once, um, you know, before he would see me just because there was a bit of a wait. But ever since he established care with me, I've been continuing, you know, I have the documentation of how I've been continuing that for him. I guess I'm part surprised because I would, I mean, maybe Park City is different with their um, primary care docs, that they would know what four medicines were uh, um, provable by the oh, FAA. But, um, he came in and said, I need to be on one of these four. Okay. <laughs> so he is very, I mean, he knows this documentation and said, hey, I need to be on one of these four medications. And I think they agreed on certainly. It's a little off, not on topic, but the issue of the validity of the testing for cognitive issues and that sort of thing is, is pretty tenuous. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'll just give you one example. The opioid issue in relationship to car crashes, if you look at the, the simulator studies, they'll say, oh, it looks like they're probably safe. The epidemiological data is unquestionable that prescription opioids are associated with 70 to more than 100% increased risk of crash. And so I'm, I'm just a little curious on, on what's done with the FAA and so if you have any knowledge of that issue. I don't know all of the tests that they do. I, I know that it's very similar to what they provide the military. And so with all of the high risk of TBI within the military, everybody who is pre-deployment, they have to do a series of co a, a cognitive battery. And it's about 30 minutes. And so that every 18 to, you know, every time one deploys again, they have to do that same. So they, they, they establish kind of like a baseline. And I gave this troop as an example, but I, I think that they're able to kind of go back and, and talk about using some of that military database of, of what they've been able to generate to be the exact test. But what is the exact test? I don't know that. I haven't taken that test myself yet. But I know this troop was one of several things. <laughs> oh, but do we have any questions online? No, we don't. That one chat up there was me soliciting questions. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you hogged the mic. I guess so. <laughs> Well, again, I thank everybody for your time.